You're listening to Boobies and Newbies. Find and follow Boobies and Newbies at Boobies Podcast across platforms and on boobiesandnewbies.com. And don't forget at Real Kelly Ray on TikTok because TikTok thinks I'm making porn if I use boobies in the handle. Thanks, TikTok. and welcome to a special holiday edition of Boobies and Newbies, the podcast that asks novice romance readers to think outside the dick in a box and brave the unbridled world of erotica. I'm your host, Kelly Reynolds, and today we are kicking off a brand new year and a brand new podcast season with a steamy spotlight author interview. That's right, January marks the start of the seventh season of Boobies and Newbies. Can you believe it? I know I can't. Thank you to everybody who joined us for season six of the podcast. Last season marked a lot of firsts for the podcast. Our first summer special, Slick Summer Nights. Our first Tit Talk panels on YouTube, which will return in 2023. And of course, my first published romance novella. You can expect to see more of all of these, plus more reviews and interviews in 2023. And of course, the best way to keep up with what's coming up next is to follow Boobies and Newbies across social media platforms at Boobies Podcast or Real Kelly Ray on TikTok. You can always catch up on past episodes of the podcast on our website, boobiesandnewbies.com, or on your favorite podcast app. If you're a fan of the podcast and you've got a few minutes to spare, I would greatly appreciate a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. And last but not least, if you want to be the first to know about what's coming up next, what we're reading, and have exclusive access to bonus clips, private chats, and so much more, you might consider hopping on over to our Patreon page. Now, as per usual, I will include links for all of the above in today's show notes. And now, Please join me in welcoming today's guest, whose latest small town romance, Chick Magnet, released just last week. It's author Emma Berry. Welcome, Emma. Kelly, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. Thank you. I'm so excited to start the new year with not only a new interview, but you are also a new to me author, which I am always excited to find because I think people have this misunderstanding that if you read romance, you read every romance novel that's out there, which is just not possible. Romance is huge. I mean, there's like literally thousands of romances published every month. The idea that like you could ever discover them all, it's just impossible, which I find delightful, right? It's like you'll always be new new to me authors. They'll always be new to me books. So yeah, thank you so much for, for giving me a try. <laughs> oh, absolutely. No, and you uh, – honestly, I, I was – hooked to read your book the moment that I read about the fact, let me see if I can get the quote from your your uh, representative's pitch, which I just absolutely loved. That was, <laughs> Emma mixes in positive portrayals of men and mental health. I mean, like, let's start right there with the green flag. Her <laughs> own real life experience with a menagerie. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, or Pets and Chickens, and even themes of gaslighting. I was like, I have to read this book. I I honestly, that's all I need. I don't even care what the rest of it is about. That's all I need to know. (laughs) I wrote it just for you. (laughs) It's the best feeling, right? Yeah. It's so true. It's so true. Well, and I definitely want to dive a little deeper into all of those, but I think we need to start with her own real life experience with a menagerie of pets and chickens, because... I the experiences that I've had with chickens have been wonderful. One of my best friends has her own little we call it her her little homestead farmstead mm-hmm. and she has chickens. I think next up on her list if she can convince her husband is to get a goat. Mm-hmm. Um I don't know how that's going to fly, but it might just be more chickens. <laughs> Typically, you start with a small number of chickens, and the next thing you know, you have a much larger number of chickens. They call it chicken math, and there's definitely (laughs) something to that. I understand. Yeah. And I thought it was the funniest thing because when she first got them, she, you know, they had moved to this property and had land, and we asked her, well, where did you get... Where did you get all the chickens? And she said, you, 
you like order like eggs online, like it's like off Amazon. And then you like pick them up at your local tractor supply is the store that she has near her. There is actually a special rate to mail live chicks in the in the mail. Like that is oh actually like a, like a particular, like a postal rate. Because if you're in <laughs> the middle of nowhere, like where are you going to get chicks? And it's such an important part of like – how people fed themselves that, like back in the 19th century, they like created like a postal rate for live chickens. So yeah, I mean, it's like bonkers, right? The whole thing is, I had no idea. And I, I got my chicken, my first chickens five years ago. Um, and I have learned so very much about it. And yeah, that's one of the fun things is you can totally get them in the mail or from yeah. your tractor supply or your local feed store or yeah, it's really cool. Well, and I don't know if people listening know this or not, but you have not had like a, a fried egg or scrambled egg. Like you have not had real eggs to eat until you have had like eggs straight from the chicken coop. Like I, I yes. had no idea that it would make like such a difference. But when I did try, first of all, they're the most yellow yolks you'll ever see in your life, but they really are so much more delicious. <laughs> It is 100% true. And that is why I got chickens. Because during the summer, at least I live in Southeast Virginia, there's lots of farmer's markets. And so you can get like farm fresh eggs. But then when the farmer's markets disappear in the fall, I was like, no, no, no. I'm not going back to grocery store eggs. Like this is settling for exactly that reason, right? The like bright yellow yolk. And they're bigger too. And like the white isn't as runny. And so it's just, I mean, it's like game changer, right? Yeah. And my critique partner and sometime co-writer, Genevieve Turner, she actually lives on a legit farm. And she does have chickens and she has goats and they have horses and um she was like no 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 it's really easy like you should and you should just get chickens and I was like babe I live like in the suburbs and she was like no you should get chickens um and so I had to convince my husband um and we currently have a dog and a cat mm-hmm. as well as gerbils we do not at the moment have fish because sadly there was like a tank chemistry incident and the, the fish are no more but for a while we also R.I.P. have fish mm. I know right fish it's it's sat it's very dangerous the tank levels be very careful of like your ph but um but we also had fish and then then the chicken so that is our menagerie of different so what's next i mean now now that you've got the chickens i feel like i feel like you said you're building up to something you got more chickens but then now what well okay have you ever seen a baby duck i have (laughs) they are criminally (laughs) adorable like okay baby chickens are cute, but like mm-hmm. that duck bill, like on the baby mm. duck, it's physically painful. And so every time we are at the feed store in the spring and they have the baby chicks, but they have the baby ducks, I'm always like, oh my God, I need one. Um, and now they don't lay as many eggs as chickens, which is why I mean, most of us end up with chickens. But I have to say, I think at some point it's going to have to be lawn ducks because yeah, they're so cute. Yeah, I mean you you could get them just for the purpose of them being cute. Like you don't you don't have to have eggs. You don't have to have reasons. It could just be to have ducks. I think so. So I feel <laughs> like at some point that's where we're headed is ducks. <laughs> I love it. Um, And I promise this is not becoming like a poultry podcast just for people listening. (laughs) However, um, I do feel the need to mention, just in case you haven't seen it, Emma, there is a documentary called Chicken People. Oh, my friend, of course I've seen it. (laughs) I'm I'm so glad. I literally recommend this to anybody anytime the subject of chickens comes up because I... I don't know if I've ever enjoyed two hours of my life more than watching Chicken People. <laughs> it's basically like if you've seen Best in Show, the yes. movie about like the dog shows, but yes. that's fictional. Obviously, this is like for real, but it's that kind of like With over the top personality. <laughs> it's great. It's so good. It's on Amazon Prime or it used to be on Amazon Prime. That's yes. where I watched it. So if you have Prime, definitely check out Chicken People. <laughs> it is worth it. So It is so worth it. That's all I'm going to say. And I will, of course, like see if I can find it still on Prime and put a link in today's show notes so everyone can go watch Chicken People. But with that being said, um, we can move beyond the menagerie. Although, of course, I'm very keen to hear if you do add to it someday. Please let me know. I will, for sure. (laughs) So the first thing that I always want to talk to authors about is their own personal relationship with romance, both as readers Mm -hmm. and writers. So how did the journey begin for you? 
That's such a good question. So the answer is sort of roundabout. Um, I was in grad school and was studying 19th century newspaper novels, like the kinds of novels that would be serialized in the newspaper. And one of my professors mentioned that she was teaching this class on women's popular culture and that a lot of the books I was writing about would sort of fit in that class. And so I was asking her about what else she was teaching. And she said she was teaching romance novels. And this was about 10, 11 years ago. And I was like, well, romance novels. I've never read one of those. So I sat down and I was going to read one, Kelly. Okay, that was the plan. Singular. Oh, one yeah. singular sensation, right? And so I literally Googled, like, what's the best romance novel? Because if I was going to read one, right, you want it to be the best one. The one. Got to right? make it the one. Singular. <laughs> There's like one romance to like roll them all. And I ended up finding that the top of the Google results were the list at All About Romance, the blog. Okay. And they like vote on, I think it's like reader voted on. Um, and the top of the list, this would have been like 2011 ish, was Lord of Scoundrels by Loretta Chase. And okay. so I had a brand new Kindle and it was like right after Christmas and I had a bunch of like Amazon gift cards. And so I bought Lord of Scoundrels and I sat down to read my one romance novel. <laughs> and I read the book and I. I don't think I'd had fun reading a book mm. in years, you know. And so here I was, a graduate student preparing to become an English professor, and I had, I don't want to say fallen out of love with reading, but I certainly was not having fun reading. Like mm-hmm. my reading was all very intellectual, and I absolutely love that book. Now I have a lot of other things to say about the book. Is that the best book to give a newbie? Um, is it a perfect book? Is it a problematic? Has book? it aged well? Exactly. I- <laughs> like there's a lot of critiques. Like I certainly would not give a newbie today. That would not be like the, my choice. But I, that book. I mean, it did. It changed my life for sure. Yeah. And so over the next two or three months, I had. Uh, newborn twins. And so I was on maternity leave and all I did, Kelly, was nurse my kids and read romance. Like I, I probably it. read like 50 romances in two months. Like every day I was like reading <laughs> a book, right? Um, and by the fall, like when I was like back at school full time and back teaching, um, I was like, I, I want to write a romance. And I had mm-hmm. never, ever wanted to write a book before. Like I had never, I took like one semester of creative writing in college, like poetry. Um, I had never thought that I could write a book. I'd never wanted to write a book. I very much saw myself as just like a person who reads books. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had such a different relationship to romances than to the literary fiction that I was reading and that I was writing about. Um, and I wanted to write something that could make people happy in the way that the romances I was reading made me happy. And so by that fall, I think I did my first nano and it was terrible. And my first book was so bad and I was so mad because it was terrible. Like it felt as if like <laughs> I'm a really good reader. Like I should be able to write a book as if those are the same skill. They are not the same skill, right? <laughs> and then I started reading about craft and then I did nano again and then I wrote a second book and then I wrote a third book and then I sold a book. And, and it was so silly. And even as I started writing more seriously, I didn't take my career that seriously until mm. probably like 2015 when I was like, ah, I should really get an agent. Like it was a very like <laughs> late process for me. Um, and so that's sort of how I accidentally backed into writing romance mm-hmm. from just wanting to read one. <laughs> No, and that's so interesting, and uh, I feel like there's, like, so many things I want to touch on from that. First of all, I want to know what school you went to where you had the option to take, like, courses on newspaper fiction. Like, I'm just like, (laughs) what? Where was that choice for me? <laughs> I actually ended up teaching a class on romance novels one summer um, <sighs> while I was in grad school. It was so like I, I convinced them that this was a good idea. It was very unique, like the kind of situation. I don't think in general English programs are that supportive of that choice. And, Unfortunately, like, no. It's such a bummer. But um, but I my faculty members were really lovely and like very supportive of my interest in pop culture and like wherever those kind of took me they were very awesome but it is not normal for sure that's that's too bad and I I'm this is coming from somebody too who I do I teach online for a university Mm -hmm. and I normally teach like introduction to creative writing courses Mm -hmm. so these are for students who are both entering like the English creative writing tracks and mm-hmm. also for students who are just taking this as like a fun elective to like mm-hmm. fulfill a requirement. And I I get a lot of students who are really interested in reading and writing romance. And so I always try to be very supportive of that because mm-hmm. of the fact that I've heard from so many authors themselves that 
if they did pursue writing in school, it was always a a genre that was like looked down upon by like higher education, which is just, yeah. I still don't understand the stigmas that we have surrounding romance in general today, just because this is a multi-billion dollar industry. Like this is clearly what people love to read. So I don't, I don't know why people aren't capitalizing on that more than they are putting it down, but yeah. that's a whole conversation for another day. So, um, <laughs> but the other thing I loved that you said, I thought it was really interesting that you mentioned about how you didn't necessarily like take yourself seriously as a writer, because yeah. this is something that I feel like I'm going to go out on a limb and say, I think women do, especially that we kind of minimize our own accomplishments, like, which, mm-hmm. and this is really kind of sticking out to me because this is something, funnily enough, I was discussing at the coffee shop this morning with the mm-hmm. barista And we were talking about books. They had a little library outside the coffee shop. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, I'm a book blogger. I actually I do a book podcast and I'm super excited. Like I'm starting the seventh season. And they made it out to be like this incredible accomplishment. Like, oh, my Mm -hmm. God, to get to seven seasons of anything, to do anything for that long is so impressive. And I told them, I'm like, yeah, you know, that's something that I kind of am working on in myself when people tell me that because – I feel like I just kind of like set it aside and like bring it down a little bit. Like, oh, no, it's it's fine. It's whatever. Like, it's just a little podcast. And I think that this is something that writers do a lot or just any kind of artists do a lot, especially women artists of, oh, it it's just a book. It's just my fourth book. It's just my 10th book. Like, yeah. no, just no, it's just. Mm-mm. Yes. I mean, I, I think. I think we tend to think it's only real if it's your day job or like it's only Mm. real if it's like award winning or it's only real if it's in the New York Times. And and I think kind of minimizing our ambitions or treating it as a hobby or, you know, it's just – it's just genre fiction. It's not like a literary novel. I mean, I I think think we do tend to do that. And in some ways, I think it can be about protecting yourself. Like if it's just your hobby, then like if it's not a super mega ultra bestseller, it's okay because it was just your hobby book. On the other hand, I think if you do that over and over again for years and years and years, you are not honoring your labor. You're not honoring the time and sweat and tears you put into that. Um, And that's you, then you can't celebrate your successes, right? So, yeah, you know, trying to get that balance between like being realistic about my goals and not being crushed if things don't always work out the way I want, but also being like, wow, I worked really hard for that and I should celebrate that. It's so funny too, because if you juxtapose like that behavior that women tend to have with, with what they're creating, whatever it is, and then you put it next to like, let's say the most mediocre of male creators saying, oh my gosh, like this is going to be the next best thing. And it's just, it's Mm -hmm. so wild. Like, like I, I hear people say it all the time. Like, I wish I had the confidence of like a mediocre white man in his fifties. And I'm like, yeah, no, honestly, like that is the, (laughs) that is the attitude that we need to bring in to whatever it is that we're working on and not minimize whatever accomplishments we're making and to not compare it to what accomplishments look like for somebody else. Because we're all we're all on our own path. We're all writing completely different things. And even if it's in the realm of romance, like your book is your book. It's not it's not my book. It's not somebody else's book. Like they're all different. Yeah, yeah ab- absolutely. And I think trying to get that balance right between like I'm on my own journey and my successes need to be internal or intrinsic at some level, mm-hmm. but also like I don't have to minimize myself or put myself down yeah. um, in order to to try not to be focused on the external or whatever. Yeah. Yes. That is the attitude we are taking into 2023, baby. So <laughs> that's the plan for everybody. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about Chick Magnet, um, which at the time that we're recording this is just around the corner from its release. But by the time this episode comes out, will have been out and will have already received so many accolades, I'm sure, (laughs) from everyone and their glowing reviews. So um, how about you tell us about Chick Magnet? Absolutely. So Chick Magnet is about a woman named Nicole, and she is a social media influencer. And her hook is that she's a backyard chicken keeper. Um, I and love it. she, <laughs> which is 100% a real thing. And she uh, has just gone through this really 
horrendous, public, humiliating breakup um, with this YouTuber. And she's decided to move across the country and sort of get a fresh start. And so she moves to a small town, which is not a place she's ever been. It's her grandmother, her late grandmother's small town. And as she's moving into her new place, um, there's a knock on the door and it is a neighbor she has never met informing her that one of her chickens is on the loose. And so she and this very good looking but very grumpy neighbor (laughs) chase the chicken in the rain um, for 30 minutes. And then he sort of like grouches off at the end. Um, And then she discovers that he is a veterinarian. Um, And he knew exactly who she was the whole time. And in fact, he's been sort of hate watching her videos through (laughs) – Through the pandemic. Um, He's got a bit of a crush on her, but he also, like, does not totally love her content because he does not like the kinds of medical advice she tends to give out on her channel. Mm. Um, So they become sort of grudging friends. Like, they're sort of antagonists. I wouldn't say enemies, but, like, antagonists. And then they're sort of friends, and then they're sort of more, right? And so that is kind of the arc of the book. And he is a veterinarian whose business is in – trouble partially related to COVID stuff, but partially related to just like changes in the veterinary industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and so he's kind of struggling. And I think his grumpiness is a bit of a put on just in the way that I think her sunshine is a bit of a put on. So that's that's the book. I love it. We've got grumpy sunshine. We've got sort of a you know enemies to lovers. We've got neighbors to lovers. We've got <laughs> chickens. I, I I mean there's so much there's so much here that uh you know sings to my heart at least personally so I'm I'm here for it I think it's also interesting that you mentioned that there is some effects of COVID of the pandemic like in the book which I I'm curious what's that been like uh to navigate as writing a book and kind of acknowledging the presence of the pandemic because I think we've seen that like the majority of authors have sort of like gone ahead and just sort of written worlds that don't necessarily like coexist with a world in which the pandemic has happened. But Mm -hmm. I'm always very curious from people who have incorporated it into their books, like what that's looked like for you. Yeah. And let me say at the start, like there is 0% wrong with ignoring COVID in your book and there's 0% wrong as a reader with being like, I don't want to read that. I totally understand. (laughs) And so I know like at the start – I'm not trying to like convince any reader that I'm that the way I approached it is right. And I knew when I put it in that there was going to be people that that was going to be a thing they didn't dig. And sure. that's totes okay. Here's my perspective. I'm that obnoxious person who's like, I can't get into friends because I don't understand how they have how they afford that apartment. <laughs> that person is like, if your character went to college, I want to know how they're dealing with their student loans. Like, that's me as as a reader and as a writer. And again, that's not for everyone. But we I... we have a lot in common. <laughs> so good. And again, I think and it's about like finding your people, right? Like, not every mm-hmm. book is for everyone. That's what makes romance delightful. There are thousands of romances, and you got to find your people. Exactly. So I really like those nitty gritty details. And for me. When someone is able to make me believe in the magic of love in a world where people have student loans, in a world where people – where COVID exists, that feels more magical for me than if we are writing in a world where those things don't exist. I totally know that's not going to be everybody's balance, but I really like that. And so when I sat down to write this book, when I started it like at the height of COVID in the middle of 2020 – And I thought at first I was just going to put a couple of references into COVID and then I could take them out later if I wanted. In some ways, I just wanted to write about the world as I was experiencing. Mm -hmm. What happened, though, was that – and I don't think there's that many words about COVID in the book. But they ended up becoming very important for both of their characterization. They became important in a world – in a way in which, like, I couldn't take it out. You know, my media habits – media consumption habits changed because of COVID. I started watching a lot more social media than I had before. I had never yeah. watched a video on YouTube that wasn't like music before COVID. Um, you know, I had never – I was on Instagram, I guess, but like did not consume that much non-book content. I started consuming tons of it, right? And like TikTok and all the rest. Um, and so it made sense to me that Nick's career might have been sort of turbocharged by COVID. Yeah. Um, 
there were also changes in people's like pet behavior around COVID. Like a lot of people got pets. Sadly, I think in the last year or so, some people have maybe given pets up that they adopted um, because of inflation and going back to work and lots of different things. Mm -hmm. There's also all these changes like happening in the vet industry right now. A lot of small practices are selling to big conglomerates. And so like the choice that Will is facing very much reflects what's happening. There is a kind of mental health crisis happening in the veterinary industry. And so like I wanted to put those things in. Again, I know it's not going to be for every reader. Um, yeah. But for me, it's suddenly the, the way – the fact that COVID causes her success but also causes his failure. I, I really liked the kind of opposite trajectories of that and I really wanted to chew on that in, in the book. So that was the kind of goal. But I don't know how readers are responding. My guess is – polarizing. <laughs> <laughs> well, and honestly, I don't I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Like I think mm-hmm. if anything we see things that maybe are a little more polarizing spark more conversation and like it leads to like a bigger conversation. And I do think that's really interesting. A lot of what you're touching on and how COVID has both positively and negatively affected so many people in a variety of ways, because it's true. I Mm -hmm. I was just listening to a podcast this morning where we were talking, where they were talking about, (laughs) I say where we were talking about, because I felt like I was there, um, where they were talking about, you know, how there have been positive effects because of the pandemic. And that's not to say that every, I would wish a pandemic on anybody in any way. However, I think it kind of gave people a lot of reasons to slow down, to Mm -hmm. look at like, they were talking specifically about work-life balance Mm -hmm. and how it was sort of a moment for us to step back and realize like, oh my God, I am working like 80 hours a week, not getting paid my worth, not seeing my friends, Mm -hmm. my family, my partner, you know, and, and just sort of like seeing how that's affected like moving forward as we kind of like are on the tail end of the pandemic and the choices we're making in response to that. And I think it's interesting too, you know, you talk about how your, your main female character has like had this breakup Mm -hmm. and which I'm sure because she is a, an influencer and her ex was an influencer is also like very public and Mm -hmm. polarizing on the internet for people as well. But I think we've seen couples break up during the pandemic. We've seen couples Mm -hmm. get together during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we've also seen the effects that it's had on people post pandemic and how there are a lot of women, especially nowadays who are saying, no, like I just know, like, you know, and so, I mean, there's just, I'm glad that you chose to include real life events in, in your book, because I, I really do think this is like a great way to show that you're not just putting it in for, I don't want to say shock value, but like for, because of like, a, it's a current buzzy topic, but that, you can actually incorporate it to then show how it's affected like each of your characters, like character arcs. So that's interesting. That at least was the goal, right? (laughs) I don't know how people are going to feel about it. I can just say that once I put it on the page and began like chewing on it, I – yeah. It, it helped me explain things or help me see things in them that I wouldn't have seen without it. Again, I know it's not going to awesome. be for everyone, but that was the goal. You know what, though? Not every book is for everyone, period. Like, I, I tell people that all the time, that the best thing I learned in grad school was that it's impossible to expect everybody to like everything you do. Like, if, if we all liked all the same things, we would have no variety. We would all be reading mystery books and watching true crime like that would be it like we wouldn't yeah. we wouldn't have anything else and so no I I it doesn't have to be for everybody yes I mean I agree the only way to write a book that everyone likes is to like Emily Dickinson your book and like leave it in a drawer and then no one will ever dislike it other than that like yes and I guess I would rather write a book that reflects my voice and look like mm-hmm. we're all polarizing people no one loves all of us that'd be great if they did but they don't it, then write something that feels generic, right? And so, I mean, I yeah. – I, yeah. yeah. And in between all of the chickens and the, you know, social media content and the grumpy sunshine, I do think there are some legit themes that you're tackling, um, specifically gaslighting and also mm-hmm. mental health, especially as it affects men, which yeah. I think are two major topics that we're discussing – even on social media today, because I I consume a lot of content from YouTube and TikTok, and 
I see these conversations about both of those topics daily. So yeah. I'm I'm very excited because I do think romance novels are a great place to explore some darker themes. That's not to say that you're reading a dark romance. Um, Lots of people do, and that's fantastic. But I think because romance novels provide a sort of safe space, knowing that in the end, it's going to work out. Everybody is going to live happily ever after, or at least happily for now. Knowing that when you go in, I think provides you a sense of security in exploring topics that are maybe like a little more difficult to talk about outside of fiction. Yeah. And I I think... For both, like, it's also important for me that sense that, like, you can have a crappy ex and be, like, dealing with your mental health and you still deserve love and you still deserve a partner who, like, helps you shore up your self-worth. And so, like, for me, like, I need to know that sad characters, characters whose businesses may be failing, also can have happy endings, right? And that kind of trying to get the balance. So for Nick, you know, she's getting over this gaslighting, this emotional abuse, really, um, One of the things with romance and gaslighting is I think it's been a theme in romance going back to like Jane Eyre. Like I don't, I mean, I I think there's also this sense that like, this is buzzy. This is, we invented it last year. Like, no, like that's a very You just weren't listening. You, this, this, the term came from the movie Gaslight, which I think came out in like the 50s. Like 44, 1944. I I remember, I watched Gaslight for a women, for a, a, a class in grad school that was called Psychotic Women in Horror. And mm-hmm. it was the first movie we watched. And most of the movies were basically chosen to have a discussion about is this actually like a psychotic woman or is she like a product of what society thinks of as psychotic? And this yeah. is just how we treat women. And Gaslight, I mean, that, that's that been out, like you said, since 1944. Like this isn't anything new. <laughs> yeah. And so I think sometimes we can feel like this is buzzy, like we just invented it, but it really is very old concepts. I think Gaslighting yeah. is sort of one of those. And then you know, with Will and his mental health struggles, I mean, I think there's a lot of stigma about seeking help for mental health, whether you're a man or a woman, but I think particularly that idea can interact with masculinity in toxic yes. ways, right? And so yes. he has difficulty admitting that he needs help. He's really worried that like if people know that his business is in trouble, they won't love him. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that comes from this idea of like the provider. And I mean, in romance, we see so many heroes who are billionaires and millionaires and that idea of a man being if not really wealthy then certainly very financially comfortable you know is that yeah. is that intrinsic for hero it does does someone have to have wealth in order to be considered a good romantic partner you know, I kind of wanted to break down some of those stereotypes with Will. Um, and uh, I don't want to talk for the end, but but I, his arc <laughs> and kind of like what happens with his business was really tied in with like, what does he value? And like, mm-hmm. does he have to face his deepest fears about this in order to be really vulnerable to love, in order to be able to say yes to Nick? Like, does he have to kind of like go to the really dark place to kind of be able to bounce back from that? Um, and so that was kind of my goal with his arc. Yeah, it's interesting, too, because when you talk about some of the things that we generally tie to heroes, male Mm -hmm. characters in romance, these are traits and positions and uh, things that, like, when we tie them to female characters in romance, people have a completely different perspective on who that woman is. And it's usually not in a favorable light. So, I mean, Mm -hmm. that, that just tells me everything that I need to know about, like kind of like deconstructing like masculinity and femininity, which I think mm-hmm. are just so outdated in general that, um, you know, it is it is sometimes hard to read those those archetypes and like uh, stereotypes in in romance novels. So I always am very excited to read, uh, you know, books like this where I do see a different side of of men and and more of like what I would think of as like an aspirational side of men, men is that I want I want men to be able to share their vulnerable side and you know take care of themselves and not be shamed for that and um, because I think that's mm-hmm. what most women want to see for men as well um it's just it's a it's a much larger issue that you know the call is coming from inside the house, fellas. <laughs> but yeah, no, I agree. And like, 
in romance, I yes, for me, Will's arc is very aspirational and is what I would want for the men in my life and the men yeah. that I know to be able to say like, wow, I do need help and to be able to say like, I'm really struggling and this is in trouble and then yeah. have people around them be like, I love you and it's not your fault and like yeah. – um, How can we and, help? And, yes. And I think Will needs to hear those messages so much um, and – uh, so I, yeah, but I agree. It is his arc is very aspirational. I think all the more reason to normalize it in the media that mm-hmm. we consume. You know, whether it's books, movies, TV shows, all of it. So yes. yay! I'm excited. This, I mean, honestly, this just makes me more excited to read your book. And honestly, by the time this episode comes out, I'm sure that I will have read it. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. There's so many books. I do understand. Like it's such a cavalcade. Um, I was looking at like all the January releases the other day, and I was like, holy. Mm-hmm cow like how can there be so many amazing books in this one month I love it I love it it's so it's so great new books new authors new to me authors every month you'll never run out you'll never you know run out of great books to read so um well looking ahead I'd love to know what's coming up next for you I mean I know that's silly to ask since like you're putting out a book this month I do not want to be that greedy reader that's just like give me more Emma but um what's coming up next (laughs) So I, I do have a book coming out in May, and it feels just utterly impossible to have two books out in four months, but it's happening. <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm really excited about my May book. I mean, I'm really excited about Chick Magnet too. But the book in May is called Funny Guy, and the concept <laughs> is that the protagonist, or one of the protagonists, um, is a comedian. His name is okay. Sam. Um, and Sam is he does stand up and he also appears on a sketch comedy show that maybe tapes on Friday nights or Saturday nights, pardon me, in New York. Um, and so <laughs> that sounds um, familiar. It does. I think, I think I've seen it. Um, and so Sam's ex is a pop star and she has written a song about him. It's called Lost Boy and it becomes like the number one hit song in the world. Um, and so there's this media firestorm around Sam, which is not unusual because Sam is mm-hmm. like a tornado in human form. Mm -hmm. Um, And so he decides to kind of sit out, hide out from this um, media firestorm at the apartment of his childhood best friend. And her name is Brie. And if he is like a chaos Muppet, Brie is like an order (laughs) Muppet. She is an urban planner. Um, She definitely believes like design can overcome all your problems, right? And if the space is just organized, it will work better. Um, And they've known each other for 25 years. There are two things she's never told him. The first is that she's in love with him, and the second is that she is finally, finally going to get over him, and she's applied for her dream job across the country to kind of get away from him. (gasps) Oh, no. Oh, no. Right? Mm. And so here they are, stuck for a week in her 500-square-foot New York City apartment, and everything starts to change. And Mm -hmm. that's what I'll tell you about Funny Guy. Well, when you're in a 500-square-foot apartment, things are bound to change. (laughs) Like, I've I've been there, so I get (laughs) – I get that one. Okay. I, first of all, you're going to need to copyright the term chaos Muppet like immediately. Like, <laughs> it's I, not I, my I, term. It's not my term. I should say it's oh. and there's the, the, um, legal analyst, it's Slate, Dahlia Lithwick wrote this okay. column a couple years ago about chaos Muppets, order Muppets. It's great. You should totally read it. And she's I like explaining it. how the Supreme Court works. But anyhow, it's really funny. But I find that really useful to think about like that pairing mm-hmm. in romance, you know, where one of them is all like drama and the other one is like spreadsheets. <laughs> I think that needs to be like the new Grumpy Sunshine is like we have Grumpy Sunshine. I want chaos Muppet order Muppet romance like I want that to be on all the marketing all the blurbs (laughs) everything (laughs) it is a very useful term um and this is definitely an example of that that kind of trope I like it I'm envisioning this as like um and this is coming from somebody who's watched SNL for the better part of her life I'm picturing this as Pete Davidson's ex, Ariana Grande, writes a song about him. Shocker. And uh, he runs into the arms of his friend, who just so happens to be Marie Kondo. And (laughs) I'm like, wow, that is a fan fiction I didn't think I was ready for, but I am here for. Let me say this, because everyone I know is going to assume that. Certainly, the many people on SNL have dated famous people they met on the show, right? Colin Jost and Scarlett Johansson and Mm -hmm. Pete Davidson. And then, like half the women Everybody. in America. <laughs> Emma Stone's husband, right, was like a like a director on SNL. Mm-hmm. So like certainly this has happened. Here's what I'll say. My goal as a writer, like I am obviously really interested in the real world and I do a lot of research. 
But for me, it's like, what's the like boundary of what's real? And then I want to like yeah. fit my story inside that. So like certainly was I inspired by the Pete Davidson, Ariana Grande thing? Yes. But – it's not real person fan fiction. At least I don't think it is. Right. I don't want it to, to read that way. Like, no, I don't it's a think jumping so. off point. Yeah. That's certainly the goal. It's like this like 1% inspiration from reality, 99% invented. So. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, do I also <clears throat> have like notes on a potential book on my computer that's like inspired by the love triangle between Jason Sudeikis Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles? Absolutely. <laughs> like, of course I do. I, I so want that book. I actually want the book that's like the entire like press junket for that movie, right? With like all of the inner cast drama. And I think we could have like five different romances happening. I want it so oh, bad. <laughs> it's so, I mean, there's just so much gold to like anybody who followed the don't worry, don't worry, darling, right? That's yes. what it was. Anybody who followed that saga and how it ties into like Olivia Wilde and Harry Styles getting together. And then there's like a side part with Shia LaBeouf. And then there's the Olivia versus Florence Pugh. And then Jason Sudeikis like in the background. And, like, like I'm is Ted Lasso like his marriage yes. fanfic? Oh my God, I want it so bad. It could be a whole so series. Good. <laughs> so good. They Yeah, exactly. They could make you know what? Give it five years and I'll bet you anything. Ryan Murphy, um, you know, the man behind all the American horror story, he's going to make something, whether it's going to be American horror story or um, I forget the other one he did, but he's going to like take that whole thing and you will see a show out, a one season anthology show that's going to be about the press junket for like this doomed movie. <laughs> If the entertainment gods are good to us. I mean, mm. like, that's all I can say. Yes. We're going to manifest it. We're putting it out there to manifest into existence. But yes. no, that one, that sounds like a fun read. I'm also like a sucker for anything um, like Hollywood related. And I also don't think there's enough out there with like comedians. I know that I've talked about this in a previous um, interview and I want to say it was with I think it was with Suzanne Park because I think she also talked about how she did stand up comedy uh, for a while. And we talked about how there aren't enough stand up comedians or like people in comedy in romance novels. So I'm excited to hear about that. It's low key terrifying though, because have you ever read a rock star romance and like inevitably, right? The the big grovel is the rock star writes like a song for the yes. love interest. <clears throat> and you're like reading it. And you're like so into the book and it's awesome. And then you get to the song and they give you the lyrics and you're like, and you're like, oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> it's like sad trombone noise because the lyrics don't feel realistic. Yes. So if you're writing a comedian protagonist in romance, yep. you inevitably have to write the stand up and I get it, it has to be funny. And like, I honestly, like, I sent out my first arcs of this book today, and I have to tell you, like, I had this moment of terror where I was like, but what if Sam's not funny? Because the whole mm -hmm. thing will, I mean, literally, it's the effing title of the book, but, like, the whole thing will <laughs> fall apart if people don't think that the sketches sound like SNL sketches or that the comedy mm -hmm. could be, like, I'm saying he's the funniest man in the world. So, like, yeah, he better be the funniest man in the world. So, I don't know. I'm really scared. <laughs> Well, you just holler at your girl over here who took sketch writing and improv classes for two years. <laughs> I will slide into your DMs. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. No. And honestly, I, I mean, I took classes, but it is it's an art form unto itself. Like, I think people think comedy is something that's easier to create than drama. And it's 100 percent not like and any comedian will tell you that anybody who writes comedy, who's acted in comedy, will tell you the same thing. It is hard. Especially without, like, the physical cues. Because, like, I yeah. feel like you can have a sketch that maybe the writing is not hilarious, but, like, the the performing or the acting, like, elevates it. But, like, this is a book. There's no performing. Right. right. So, like, You've got words on a page and that's it. <laughs> I also can't pull from, like, real life. Because, like, if they called mm -hmm. us tomorrow and they were like, Emma, Kelly, write an SNL sketch, we could do it. Like, I believe 100% yeah. we could do it. Because we would take something funny that happened in the world and then we would write, like, a parody of it. But I can't do that for the book, right? Because the book's going to come out a year after I wrote it. And so you can't pull <laughs> from real life. Like, I can't make fun of the Don't Worry Darling press tour because – 
that's not happening at that moment. I don't know. I think it'll always be funny, personally. <laughs> like, I think it will always be funny. And if people are listening, thinking, what the hell are they talking about? I don't know where you've been the last, like, 12 Six months. Yeah, like, for sure. You need to get onto TikTok, do a quick Google search. Like, I have no doubt somebody has archived a full timeline of events. And it is, it's worth it. It's worth it. What? Do that and then watch Chicken People, the documentary. Those are the two <laughs> things to do this weekend after listening to this podcast. <laughs> totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we know what's coming up next for you. Chick Magnet is now out in the world. And I think the last thing I want to ask you, Emma, is, is there a dream project or story that you have just kind of like lurking around your brain that you haven't gotten to yet, but someday soon would love to see in the world? So my, I don't want to say too much about it, but I just finished writing my option material <clears throat> for Motlake for my publisher. Um, and okay. the like the the proposal I'm most excited about, I'll just say two words: medieval times. And so oh. <laughs> we'll have to see, like like if the they time period it. or the restaurant. The restaurant. Okay. <laughs> I was going to be I was going to be happy with either response but in my heart I was like ooh the restaurant please so we'll we'll have to see if they go for it clearly I cannot write a normal book Kelly they're like Emma just give us a normal romance and I'm like right what if he's a knight no no like a knight today yeah <laughs> I don't know I think I'm your audience personally like I can't I can't speak for anybody else but I'm like yeah, gaslighting. Great. Yeah, the don't worry, darling saga. Awesome. Um, you know, we're gonna write about medieval times restaurant. Okay. Like, I mean, this this all sounds like it's up my alley. So you've got at least one reader in me. Woohoo. I will totally take it at this point. One hundred percent. I love it. Well, um, please tell the fine folks listening at home where they can find, follow you, you know, breed up on all your previous books. So on the web, I'm at authoremmaberry.com, and you'll find all my links to social media. I'm mostly probably on Twitter um, and then on Instagram, but all the links are there, and I would love to see you, and I love to hear from readers. So if you do, you know, watch Chicken People, read Chick Magnet, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like the perfect <clears throat> thing to do together, you know, watch – Chicken people, read the book, vice versa. Like they, you know, they just go hand in hand. I agree. It's, it's like the perfect one-two punch of chicken <laughs> weirdness, but also sexy romance. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we want is chickens, romance, you know, and everything in between. So great. Sounds like a good weekend. Sounds like something I'm going to be doing this weekend. So <laughs> cheers to us. so much for listening. Tune in every Friday for a brand new episode of Boobies and Newbies. And don't forget, you can always catch up on previous episodes on your favorite podcast app or on boobiesandnewbies.com. Happy reading!